Good evening, everybody. If you are over on this side of the world, um, Keen O'Neill here, based in Cork Institute of Technology in the south of Ireland. Um, good afternoon or good late morning to all uh, colleagues over in the United States of America uh, and that uh, seaboard, that side of the Atlantic. Uh, and of course, um, good day to everybody who has been uh, tuning into our webinars to date um, from Australia, New Zealand, Asia. Uh, we've been very fortunate to have such a, a wide and disparate audience uh, tuning in to all these webinars that we've been hosting. Um, it's my pleasure uh, to be with you all today. Um, I'm going to be speaking with, um, with a very interesting uh, character, uh, Derek Bold, who is uh, a member of the strength conditioning team um, at Valparaiso University with a specialism, um, of course, in, uh, in basketball, but also softball and men's tennis. Um, his particular remit is in the strength and conditioning domain within those groups. Um, so Derek, you're very, very welcome to be with this, uh, us here this evening. And I'm looking forward to spending some time talking to you, not only about yourself and, uh, and your journey um, in the strength and conditioning world and working with collegiate athletes, but also with, with your use of the MetriFit athlete monitoring platform. Well, thank you very much, Keith, for having me today. I, uh, I, I greatly appreciate it. Yeah, listen, it's, uh, it's always great speaking to coaches, speaking to practitioners. Um, I myself, are, I'm a practitioner myself. I work in the Gaelic football domain in Ireland. But I really uh, love and appreciate the opportunity to speak to, uh, to other experts in their fields like yourself uh, who can perhaps share their story and, uh, and give us an insight into some of the, the practices and indeed best practices that you operate with. Um, you might just start by giving us a brief introduction to yourself, Derek, and letting us know, um, you know all about your journey, your pathways to how you got to where you are today in, uh, in Valparaiso University with the athletics program. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, <clears throat> so I think, I think my path started off very similar to most, most sport performance strength coaches. Uh, competed a lot in athletics when I was younger. Uh, got to that high school age, felt like I want, there was more I could do to keep up. Um, so that's when I started hitting the weight room. For good or for bad, I was probably doing it wrong at the time, but you know, I think we all learned from our mistakes on that part. Um, I, I actually kind of got into uh, strength and conditioning rather late, later than I would have liked to. Um, okay. I, really didn't start, I really didn't start volunteering until my senior year of... Um, of my uh, uh, undergraduate degree at Iowa State University. I, uh, the football coaches there, uh, strength coaches, I'm sorry, were, were, for, were, were grateful enough to let me uh, volunteer in the early mornings there for the workouts. So it's been about two, three hours every day. A um, lot of, <clears throat> picked up a lot, lot of things those first, those first couple months. Uh, it was, you know, very overwhelming at first, but I learned a lot from those guys. Um, sure. You know, really, really cut my teeth with just you know cleaning and you know whack, helping guys rack weights. Um, after that, uh, I immediately went to the Chicago Bulls. Um, wow. Probably met my greatest influence there. Um, as an intern, I learned a lot from uh, Eric Helland. He's been a uh, he's been a huge impact on on everything I I know to date. Um, and also Josh Bonatal, who's currently at Purdue University. Um, collectively, and also within the organization of the Bulls, uh, th those two guys shaped probably 85% of everything I do now as well. Um, and those are two guys I consistently go back to if I have questions. Um, following the Bulls, I went uh, spent some time at the University of Louisville. Uh, did an internship there with football. Um, it was a shorter one. It was only about five, six months. Um, it was during the in-season. Um, so it wasn't necessarily a lot of weight room time or traditional strength and conditioning that they were doing the summer workouts. Um, yeah. uh, following that, I uh, spent about a year and a half in the private sector at a uh, business called TC Boost, which is in the north shore of Chicago, Illinois. Um, a wide range of athletes there, any anywhere from from middle school, high school, um, college kids, uh, a couple professionals, and then occasionally uh, general population. Um, so it was it was definitely a big it was a big change for me having to be a part of the sales aspect of it. 
Mm, um, sure. Ultimately, the, ultimately, the sales aspect, I think, is what led me back into uh, the university setting. Um, I was fortunate enough uh, that uh, Valparaiso was looking for a graduate assistant uh, strength coach who could handle their men's basketball team. Um, and, and Bryce Drew, he was a coach here at the moment. He uh, spoke with him for about a month or so before uh, we, we pulled the trigger, and uh, I came here. and. I've been here for the past five years, and this fall will be uh, my sixth season with the team. Excellent, excellent. What I like about your journey is that it's, uh, you know, it's, it's been through many different challenges, if you like, You're moving from, um, you know, a graduate intern, moving into a big franchise like the Chicago Bulls, moving into the private sector, working with different athletes and players from, from a multi-sport environment, coming back to the collegiate uh, environment. Yeah, you, you've really had it all and you've had some fantastic mentors along the way. So um, it sounds like the perfect grounding for the role you're in at the moment. And uh, I'm sure you're very grateful for that, uh, for that pathway. Absolutely. If it, if it wasn't for, for Bryce Drew, um, and, and also I, I should mention Roger Powell, he's, he was, when I was with the Bulls, he was, uh, he, was, he was still playing basketball all the time. I got to work with him. If it wasn't for those two guys, uh, I wouldn't be here. Um, and they gave me a lot of responsibility early on, and I'm, I'm very thankful for those two guys. Great. Excellent. You, you learn quickly. You grow up fast by the sounds of it. And um, I will come back to, particularly, I'm particularly interested in your time with the Bulls, obviously. Um, you know, such a, a noted franchise all over the world. Um, basketball um, is quite a popular game in Ireland, but obviously it wouldn't have the same grasp as, as it would have in, in the U.S., um, but um, the Bulls would be one of those teams that everyone can, uh, can recognize and can relate to over this side of the Atlantic. Um, but just in terms of where we are today, um, what we're going to talk about in particular, Derek, is um, those key areas around athlete monitoring, athlete wellness, and you know, basically how to interpret things and understand things like training load and communicate this to your athletes and um, engaging with them so that they, they get a grasp of their own understanding, their own development. Um, and then finally, we'd like to top it off with that, you know, just getting your own approach um, to this whole process of the whole health and wellness aspect, particularly with collegiate athletes who, who are trying to manage and balance both their academic studies and their athletic performance. And I was particularly intrigued by what you said earlier on with regard to your mentors that, you know, you would imagine that 85% of what you still do today, you know, you would have learned and developed through working with them. And I'm particularly interested in hearing about that other 15%. So um, we'll definitely come back to that later. But um, yeah, just to the core theme of where we are, athlete well-being. Um, Looking at subjective questionnaires uh, and monitoring platform like Metrifit, how much value um, as an SNC coach do you place on this, particularly working in the at the third level, the uh, collegiate sector? Yeah, I, I I place I place a tremendous value on it. Um, it's it's my morning newspaper. Um, it's what I read in the morning. Um, obviously, some of the guys don't have it filled out quite that early, but. I like to go back and look at the, the previous days, um, you know, activity logs, you know, see kind of where we're trending, um, especially during the season. Um, just the loads uh, that, that these guys go through can sometimes be enormous. So it, it's always nice to have a good idea of where we're trending, whether it be up, down, um, flat, uh, you know, linear plateau. Um, and then as far as like the, the body and mind reports, you know, that, that gives me a template for, for talking to the guys. You know, I, that, that's our talking point. I can have personalized conversations with the guys. You know, I can ask them about, you know, things that are going on in their lives just based on the reports that I'm getting from there. Sure, sure. And would you regard that, that the body and mind aspect to that as possibly the most important facet of the whole area of athlete monitoring, or is it just one of many that you place huge value in? It is one of many. I might weigh it a little bit more heavy just because of the communication that I have with the guys. It's um, you know, their education is very personal. Um, I mean, like you said, I, I work with multiple teams, but, but this is men's basketball is the only team that we currently utilize um, the product with. And I, I spend a lot of time with these guys. I'm with them on the road. Um, you know, so we, we see each other six, seven days a week for good or for bad. So we don't, 
I know the things that they're going through, and you know, even sometimes I can't see it all, and and the body and mind just kind of is the finishing you know piece of the puzzle to to really get an idea of what these guys are doing uh, when they're away from the gym. Those other twenty one hours of the day. Sure, sure. And tell me, have you been surprised, or are you particularly curious? In, in any of the you know the variables that we might look at, such as mood state, sleep quality, muscle readiness, so on and so forth, do any of those jump out at you that you see as re reoccurring challenges for collegiate athletes simply because of the university life, the lifestyle, the studies? Um, like obviously some of them are quite obvious, like you know uh, muscle soreness, you know muscle readiness. If these guys are training hard, you'd expect you know that that they're going to peak and they're going to trough at different times. But how about things like stress levels or mood state? Do you really find a value in those variables and by virtue of using the platform? Yeah, um, I think I think stress uh, secondary to sleep quality and quantity. I think stress level is another huge one that uh, that I like to look at, um, and, and you can kind of see that thing trend almost in tune with the uh, academic calendar um, so so the rigors these guys are going through with with their classes I could basically look at that and I could know if they're stressed I know that midterms are coming up or I know that they've been working hard on uh, certain projects stuff like that um, so, so, so absolutely I think, I think stress is another big one um, top of the list for me would probably be sleep and sleep quality um, I don't think the guys truly understand until they start, you know, logging it on a daily basis. You know exactly what they might be missing out, uh, not just on the actual total hours of sleep, but you know how they're, you know, if they're staying asleep all night, if they're constantly um, shifting around at night, uh, or having a hard time going to sleep. Sure, sure. Yeah, it's actually something I see uh, with my own players at the moment. Uh, Gaelic football at, at the level I coach, the elite level. It's an amateur sport, but with very much based on a professional ethos. So, I mean, we were in a conference final last weekend. My guys were playing in front of 66,000 people. Um, and then a lot of them were back at work the next day, you know, which, which, which seems yeah. kind of crazy, you know, that they're, they're playing on that kind of a high stake scale, but yet they're back in work after such a, an event of that magnitude. But the one thing that, that really concerns me is I'm looking at five, six hours in terms of sleep duration a day for several players for three to four days a week. Um, so trying to educate them about that, it's, it's a challenge because they're trying to fit in training with their work and then still be up the next day. And without MetroFit as a monitoring platform, I would never have that, that information, that data to open a conversation with them. Absolutely, I, I agree 100%. It's, it's, been a, it's, been a, it's been a game changer, not only for me, but, but for all the athletes that I work with. Sure, sure. The whole topic of training load, obviously, it's uh, you know, it's becoming very, very popular, and and for good reason. You know, I'm I'm based in the sports science world myself, um, so I spend a lot of time in this space. Um, is it something that you devote quite a lot of time to, and um, not just from a, an S and C perspective, but also obviously the core time um, and everything else that the guys build into their training program across the week as a as a micro mesh or micro cycle. Yeah. Um... I thought initially, when I first got the product, I wasn't really thinking about the impact of the sport itself. But once those guys start putting that information into the uh, into, into Metrofit, you you see the impact. Like you can you can compare, you know, my my session with them in the weight room. You compare that to what they're doing, two three hours a day out in the court, and you get a really good idea of. What at certain times of the year, um, what what stressors are? I shouldn't say stressors. What what what's placing uh, bigger importance um, in the athlete's career at that moment? Yeah, yeah. How, how big of a preseason on that? Um, you know, at, at collegiate level in terms of basketball, how big of a preseason in terms of a window have you guys got? For where obviously your training load is going to be spiking consistently for a period of time relative to when you're in season you know what is the, the variation between those two cycles in your in your season so um college basketball in america it's it's very much a, a year-round sport um these guys get a 
couple pockets where they get a week or two off a year, and that's about it. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we actually we kind of have like a soft start. It's a uh, NCAA limited eight hours that you get um, in, when you're out of season. So we get eight hours of contact time. That's a combination of court work, uh, strength and conditioning, conditioning, um, and then maybe film stuff if you're doing that. So we get like a soft start with that in August yeah. when the guys come back to school, which is kind of a nice little ramp up to when we start our actual preseason, which is end of September. Um, and then that preseason will go all the way until early November, which is when the season itself will uh, fully start. Sure. So you got your preload before your preseason almost. Yeah, yeah. It, uh, I don't know if they planned it out that way, but it, it works out quite well. <laughs> yeah, sure. And do, do you find yourself paying more attention then to the workload monitoring, like obviously in your preload and then your preseason relative to in-season, or do you place the same value right across that cycle? Uh, I think the shift, so that immediate shift, so that first, second week when you're ramping up the hours, I will definitely watch that. Um, get an idea of necessarily how big of a jump has been made between you know the overall workload, um, sure. and then absolutely during during the regular season, we, we just we constantly keep an eye on that so that we know, well, like I said earlier, where we're trending. And I, I suppose you'd have to be more uh, tuned in for your road trips. I mean, what would be the furthest distance that you might uh, travel, Derek, in terms of? trying to plan for that, the detail of it, then the, the games on the road, and then the return to Valparaiso. I mean, how difficult, how challenging is that, and how does the, the monitoring platform feed into that? Um, so, I mean, this year, I know for sure we'll be out on the West Coast. We'll be out in Los Angeles. Um, so I, that's about a flight-wise, that's four hours. Um, I, there is a lot of planning that goes into it um, as far as um, – you know, practices, um, if we're going to do any sort of uh, workouts on the road with myself, whether it be a lift or conditioning. Um, but I think the Metrofit platform itself helps out a ton with, with knowing kind of how the guys are handling the road, um, especially with the new guys, because with our freshmen, it, it's a big culture shock right away. You're not, you're not playing across the county on a Friday night anymore. You know, you might be playing across the country across multiple state lines and you know the very next day you got to be up in class for 9 a.m. 8 a.m. something like that sure sure yeah and I think that's the real the true value of a monitoring platform like Metrofit whereby at collegiate level it's so different you know to the pro game and that's why I was I was wanting to come back at some stage you know to your time with the, with the Bulls as well did you use any monitoring platform like that when you were uh, in Chicago or how did the sports science team or the, the strength conditioning team work through athlete monitoring at that level? Uh, when I was there, that was 2010, um, we, we didn't have any monitoring system. Um, and that, that's kind of where I initially learned that you have to communicate with the athletes, even if you're not monitoring them, um, whether it be uh, through like a catapult type system or other sort of wearable monitoring or sure. a questionnaire. Uh, literally, that's when I learned the first thing that you got to do every morning is, you know, first thing I say to my guys is, you know, how you feeling today? Um, you know, how you feeling? How you sleeping? Um, you know, that's the first thing that comes up every day. And and the guys know that I'm not a coach. I'm not, I'm sorry, I'm not a sports specific coach. They know, you know, kind of through our, our trust that, you know, you don't need to lie about injuries to me or lie about, you know, certain lifestyle things that are going on that I'm, you know, I'm there for the athlete's best interest. I don't control how much playing time they may get. So them being honest with me at that helps both of us out in the long run. Sure, sure. And yeah, no, I, I totally agree with your point there. And it actually ties in nicely with where I'd like to take this, uh, this conversation. Um, the whole area of communication and feedback, which for me ultimately is, you know, one of these, the most important aspects of using any monitoring tool whereby it actually becomes player-driven, player-centric, and so you're not trying to almost 
drag or to elicit the information out of them. Um, how do you find that works? Um, obviously, it's a process and it needs to build and develop over time. Um, but do you find that the players you know, are engaging with it and feeding back to you as much as you're feeding forward to them? Uh, it's definitely dependent upon the players. Um, I think the biggest thing, sometimes the biggest challenge, especially with new guys or guys who never really put much thought into what they do outside of the bas outside of the gym, is their lifestyle. They've never thought about the impact of a lack of sleep has on them or poor nutrition. You know, some of the guys have gotten to where they are in spite of that. Um, but once they start to understand that when they put the effort in, that you know they can make themselves you know, that much better, a little more resilient, um, spend less time in the training room. Uh, yeah. I think that's when you really start to build build a rapport uh, with the athletes and, and they understand that you're, you're there for their best interest. Um, it's, you know, like we're going through like our freshmen right now, a little bit of a learning curve, just kind of getting them used to, you know, filling it out on a daily basis. Um, so it, we kind of take baby steps on that. I don't bombard them right away with, you know, why did you only get four hours of sleep, and uh, sure. why are you, why is your, why is your mood so poor? So I, it definitely depends on the athlete and how long they've been using it, and, and how comfortable I might feel with, with kind of ramping up our um, our education and uh, our feedback responses. Sure, sure. And I guess for someone like yourself who's involved in team sports, like in basketball, no doubt you've got 12 or 14 players on your roster. If it's a soccer team, you've 18 to 20. If it's a football team, you guys have 60 or 70. Um, I mean, there's only one Derek Bowden. You know, there's only, you know, several on the, the support team for these players. So having a platform like uh, a Metrofit, I presume, would enable you to identify you know, specifics, outliers, people that you really need to have a prompt conversation with um, that you would only know that information from getting a summary sheet every morning, as you like to call it, your morning newspaper. Yes, absolutely. It, uh, it's, you know, I say morning newspaper, it's, it is the first thing that I turn to. Um, if not for that, you know, the last, we've been using it for the past year. Um, you know, who knows how many things I could be missing, um, you know, just compounding injury, stuff like that almost. Sure. No, I hear you on that. Where, where I live is two hours away from where I coach. So when I get into my car and I'm leaving the university to drive across the country, you know, I take great kind of uh, comfort in the fact that I have my report and I can start to make those informed phone calls while I'm on the road if I haven't made them already that morning, you know. So it allows me as a coach um, to be time efficient and to be on top of things as opposed to waiting until you get to the training field and then you're trying to speak to 10 or 12 players and you've only got a short window to do that. So um, I totally agree with your point there. Um, and that then brings it back full circle to the athletes themselves. Um, what are the key challenges, I guess, you know, in every self-report measure, whether it's for research or whether it's for a, a practical uh, game environment, competitive environment, is engagement. What, what do you use? What processes do you use? How do you encourage your athletes to, to engage with this? Because obviously the, you'll only get the true benefit when the true information is in there, you know? So how is it that you get the most out of the system? Yeah, I mean... You know, when we first started, there was, you know, the um, the the compliance was probably sixty six percent, something like that. So two thirds of the guys were were staying on top of it. Um, over the summer, we really made an emphasis that you know we wanted everybody to do it. You know, it's it's for you guys. Sure. It's, it's it's for all of us as a team. You're not, you know, it only takes twenty to thirty seconds to fill it out in the morning. After a workout, it takes 15 seconds. Um, you don't have to write anything. It's, it's all sliding scale. It's not that hard. These guys, you know, are other than sleeping, they're pretty much have their hand on their phone, anyways. So it, it's not that hard for them to do. And you know, we've kind of we've set up a system to where you know we expect them to have it done before you know before they step in the weight room or before they step on the court that. It, it, it needs to be done. Um, sure. And then kind of 
kind of the, the lessons that I and some of the athletes have learned is some of the guys over the last year who've, who've made the, gr the greatest strides, I found, um, were actually the guys that had the greatest compliance. You know, they, they, wow. they took to it right away. Um, you know, they were asking me questions. You know, they came up to me, you know, after weeks of filling it out and kind of noticing their, their own individual trends, they came up to me and they wanted to learn more about, you know, whether it be nutrition, um, other certain lifestyle things. And these are the guys that probably made the biggest impact on their own lives um, f for positive reasons. Sure. That, that's fascinating. And, you know, it's something I've experienced myself using uh, using a system for many years now, as I said, once again, at, at an amateur level, but with, uh, with semi-professional kind of uh, players, if you want to call them that. But two things really struck me there in terms of what you're saying, Derek, insofar as that, first of all, it really has to come down to education. Players... You know they're inherently selfish and any athlete is and they need to be to be to be the best they can be to challenge for honors so unless they see some sense of reward unless they see the end game being a benefit to their performance they're not going to buy into it and that's why i feel education is a key thing but the second thing then is also when they start to see the benefit to their own performance they can join the dots themselves that of course it's not just because they're using um, an, an athlete monitoring system, but it's definitely one factor or even one percentage point in terms of performance improvement or imp performance increment. Would you agree with that? A a absolutely. It's through the body and mind reports, you know, I can tailor the message that that's coming to the guys individually. You know, if we need to send out a group message, uh, you know, for, if I'm meeting up with the guys before or after practice, if I'm noticing certain things, it's tailored to the group. It's not just some random, you know, tidbit that's posted on the on the poster board or hanging in the hallway. It's something that's relevant to the guys at the time in their lives that's going to have the most impact. Sure, sure. And tell me just on that, you know, because it sounds like you've developed and created your own system with your athletes. What works for Derek Bull and his team and in Valparaiso may not be the same thing that had to work for Coach X or Coach Y in, in Penn State or you know UCLA or wherever. So wh what are your own little nuggets uh, of kind of invaluable information that you've learned along the way using a system like this? You know what what approach works best for you with your athletes that maybe you haven't mentioned yet already? I think indirectly the uh the program Metrofit has, has just taught me to be more personable with the guys, a um, lot more, uh, lot more compassionate, a lot more em empathetic with the guys, the situation that they're going through. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I played, I played two years of college hockey. Um, it wasn't at the same level that these guys are going. So the commitment that that um, all the athletes that I work with, whether it's men's basketball, softball, or tennis, is is rather enormous. And the pressure that's that's put upon the men's basketball program here is even higher. Um, you know, they're they're expected to compete for conference championships and to play in the NCAA tournament every year. So it, it's taught me to step into their shoes more. Um, and growing up as a hockey player and never playing basketball, um, I've had to learn a lot about the actual culture, uh, the basketball culture. Um, sure. What these guys go through on a daily basis, you know, their experiences when they're in high school and how they change to the college game. Yeah. So I, I think the program itself has provided me with enormous indirect benefits outside of what I use a lot being uh, body and mind, um, workloads, um, and then monotony and strain reports, um, just the little intangibles that aren't even listed on the program. Sure, sure. And something you mentioned there just uh, kind of reinforces one of the, the key things that I find using the uh, the platform itself is the, the level of trust that can be established between the players themselves and the coaches, the coaching team, the manager, because what I find is that if players are filling this out, and particularly when they have, you know, for example, high stress levels, low energy levels, whatever the case may be, if that is enacted upon, because the management team or the coaching team aren't engaging with the platform, well, then the players you lose trust in it and they don't really feel that it's, it, it's working for them or they're gaining anything for it. But in contrast, when you actually react to that, instigate a conversation, in some cases reduce their load or pull them from a session, then they realize that 
people are actually listening to us here. They're listening to what I have to say. They're valuing my opinion. So I, I think that's a crucial aspect of it too because you cannot beat the relationship or the, the, the strength of trust in a relationship between a player, an athlete, and, and a coach. Absolutely. I mean, the athletes don't understand, it, like the saying goes, the athletes don't understand how much you care until you, until they, until you show it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, when, when, when guys start to see that workouts are individualized for them, you know, that they, whether it's in season or out of season, that they're being pulled for various reasons, they start to understand that, okay, he's not using this information to, to rat me out or to tell on me or mm -hmm. you know, show the coach that I'm not doing something. You know, there, there's an actual reason behind it that, you know, the player's welfare, well-being is priority number one. Oh, yeah, and ultimately, that, that's the whole purpose of the Metri Fit um, Athlete Monitoring Platform. I think we'd all agree. Um, Derek, listen, that is absolutely fantastic. Thank you for taking the time out of your uh, your busy day to uh, to speak to us, um, folks. That's Derek Bull, uh, strength conditioning coach in Valparaiso University with the men's uh, Crusader basketball team as well as softball and men's tennis. I'd just like to thank Fives, our sponsor for this webinar series, and Derek will definitely be keeping a close eye on the Crusaders' progress this year as you enter your new conference. Oh, thank you very much. Okay, my man. Thank you, and take care to everybody all over the world listening in. God bless.